Good day to everyone. Now it is already 25 years ago that we have done this work on the Jadana gas pipeline. Unbelievable how fast the time is running. It is now already September 2023 when I published this video here. Compared to publications made by others on our work in general and in the Kanchanaburi forest area, I have to say that in this video here provides the true story from the beginning to the end. This video was made by myself, and my name is Werner Schweppes, and I was the former Tasco Mansman Joint Venture Project Director. I was responsible for everything on the project including the construction site. When something went wrong all the blames from PTT and Nova Gas came to me. Those people had held me even responsible when some of our people had car accidents after work hours. Hardly to believe but true. For information, the Yodana gas pipeline that the Tasco Mansman Joint Venture built between 1997 and 1998 delivers about 25% of Thailand's natural gas demand. The majority of this gas is consumed by the Ratchaburi power station. Some of the gas continues from PTT's operation and maintenance center to other pipelines as well. Thailand's total power generation is dominated by 58% of natural gas, according to a Bangkok Post article dated on 14 of October 2019. In general, one can say that pipelines are very important to secure the energy supply for a country. This applied as well to the Jadana pipeline. It should be remembered as well that from the middle of 1997 throughout 1998, we had an economic crisis that was called the Thai Bot Crisis. I mention this here because our legitimate progress payments from PTT were very slow, and it was always problematic to get the monthly progress approved. PTT change order payments were received by us more than two and a half years later, after the project was finished. With our acceleration measures and the extension of time amendments, we were luckier and received those payments in July 1999. This video describes in picture and sound our work between the pipeline kilometer 28 to the pipeline kilometer 19 of the Jadana gas pipeline, and it provides in detail the problems that occurred as well. It includes beyond the interesting pipeline story many fascinating pictures of our work in the National Forest Reserve area. Furthermore, this documentation describes in detail the pipeline work methods used by us. I have to mention as well that sadly due to mainly driving accidents some of our people died as well. Rest in peace. To build the 238-kilometer long Jadana pipeline in the specified time frame was a really tough project with having in the peak 1900 people on the job. We were well equipped as well, and the working morale of most of our people was good. Due to the circumstance of delay and disruption of our work, we were working all over of the 238 kilometers of pipeline stretch, namely in 20 locations at the same time. After all the years that have passed already, I would say the correct description of our construction work in the 6-kilometer forest area in the forest would be pipeline mission impossible. Considering all the circumstances that impacted our work I have to say that this matter was really complex and the time pressure to complete the work was extraordinarily tough. Here in this video, I tried to keep the view to the technical work matters as far as possible. However, it has to be mentioned here that PTT did not provide us 47% of the land to build the pipeline as it was required by the contract. However, they insisted that the project completion date was the date as it was specified in the contract, namely for mechanical completion, the 15th of June 1998. Therefore, we worked early on a recover schedule that included a major construction acceleration program. Everyone who reads this and knows the project would agree that we had many challenges, but the biggest challenge of the Jadana gas pipeline for our construction work was the 6 kilometers restricted right of wear through the Kanchanaburi's Hue Kang National Forest Reserve. Especially the pipeline work in the National Forest area resulted in negative and sometimes completely wrong public media reporting, followed by some unauthorized illegal demonstrations and two areas in which our pipeline construction work was blocked. In reality it was not the Tasco Mansman joint venture that was blocked, it was the Thai government with their good intention to secure Thailand's energy. It has to be pointed out as well that the majority of people living in Kanchanaburi were in favor of the Jadana pipeline project. Many of those people where the pipeline was passing through were employed by us. Those people did not like the protesters that came mainly from Bangkok. It was reported that earlier in June 1997 25 village headmen and Camden from Kanchanaburi province submitted letters to Thailand's prime minister, claiming that 99% of the local inhabitants supported the project. This led to a big pro-pipeline demonstration in June 1997 in Kanchanaburi. In spite of all negative reporting by the television and newspaper media and protests, mainly on Pipeline Kilometer 28 and the other protest at Pipeline Kilometer 152, the Thai government decided by early March of 1998 that the project was allowed to use the route through the forest after PTT had limited the construction right-of-way from 20 meters to 12 meters. 
On pipeline kilometer 152 on which the pipeline runs adjacent to the road 3085 that is surrounded by farm fields, the route was to be used as specified on the contract drawings without changing anything. Unfortunately, this verdict came very late, and the timing of it was of course completely out of our control. As a pipeliner I have to say that a 12-meter right-of-way is insufficient for a normal 42-inch pipeline construction in an easy flatland area. In an extremely difficult mountain area, it was a completely new challenge which we never experienced before. The area at pipeline kilometer 27 and 28 was cleared from protesters on 6 March 1998. With this clearance the pipeline work could finally start and commenced on the after the 6th of March 1998 in this area and was at the end successfully completed by the 31st of July 1998. The question why PTT had chosen the pipeline road through the Huey King National Forest Reserve is answered in my other video that I have published on YouTube. Jadana, my project experience. However, I will give a short answer here to this question. Time and money savings is the answer. Going back now to the events that were happened. On 3 October 1997, Change Order 22 was issued by PTT, limiting the right-of-way in the National Forest area from 20 meters to 12 meters. The approval to carry out our work in the entire Thai forestry era between pipeline kilometer 50 and pipeline kilometer 0 was given to us in the construction meeting on of November 1997. This late approval to proceed with the construction work constituted a huge delay of 32 weeks. At the same time, we prepared a schedule in which we showed the delays occurred in the project, reflecting the new project completion date on 30 October 1998. Nevertheless, due to a planned construction acceleration by us the mechanical completion date was improved to 21 August 1998. PTT by the beginning of December 1997 acknowledged that TMJV had to mobilize additional manpower and equipment to carry out the recovery work in the area, from pipeline kilometer 0 to pipeline kilometer 50. In January 1998, PTT reconfirmed to us their position that recovery measures that are properly documented and have justified costs would be reimbursed by PTT. Our implemented recovery program showed 70 days of recovery and was later achieved only due to enormous work efforts provided by us. The viewer should keep in mind that in the forestry area form pipeline kilometer 28 to pipeline kilometer 19, our construction work could only begin after the 6th of March 1998. It was completed by achieving mechanical completion on 21st of August 1998. Here is a description of the situation in the Thai forestry era during the project execution in January 1998. We were working full speed with our crews going into the north direction towards the restricted right-of-way area that was starting at pipeline kilometer 26.6. On the 22nd of January 1998 at the pipeline kilometer 28.8, we were stopped by an environmental group and our work abruptly came to a hold. In spite of all the good talk by us to the protesters we could not continue. This stop of our pipeline construction work and the illegal protest assumed major importance and was only resolved in early March of 1998. It was only after the Prime Minister of Thailand convened a committee to examine the issues and decide whether the pipeline should continue in the affected area or whether an alternative pipeline route should be adopted. The Prime Minister's committee decided that work should continue by following the specified pipeline route through the forest. But those protesters did not accept the Prime Minister decision and continued their illegal protest. They were moved out by force as shown in the next section of this video. Our construction work could only resume after the removal of the protesters was done. The delay attributable to this circumstance was almost six weeks. Considering this forced work stoppage to us and the negative impacts of the restricted right-of-way our situation could be summarized as follows. Negative impact number one was that the reduction of the width of the right-of-way imposed upon us a change in our construction methods to be adopted and caused more delays and disruptions to our work in consequence of the lack of working space. Negative impact number two was the presence of the marketable trees on the right-of-way in the area of pipeline kilometer 26.8 and pipeline kilometer 20.8 and the time that we spent in removing them. The removal of those trees was ordered by PTT to us. This as well slowed our front-end operations down in preparing the right-of-way. Again, we had to adopt changes in our normal construction methods because it was not our plan to remove those trees. Negative impact number three was that the rainy season commenced and in the time from the 8th of May 1998 through the 31st of July 1998. In total, in those 85 days of our work time it rained on 54 days. Negative impact number four was that in addition, the completion of the steep slope at the pipeline kilometer 20.5 was conditioned upon the availability of the entire area of the restricted right of way, that means coming from pipeline kilometer 27.5, and this way was not available. 
all of the aforementioned impacts resulted in an additional time spent by us to complete the work, as it can be seen on the bar chart included in this video. The chart shows the planned and actual work conducted by us and reflects clearly the following delay impacts that were. First effect, late work start. Second effect, rainy season and the change in pipeline work condition. Third effect, the change in the pipeline work condition means that we had to use different construction methods that were much slower. Considering all those negative effects that I have mentioned here, we worked in total 64 days more than it was originally planned on the limited right-of-way the 6-kilometer long pipeline strip. Now I will tell and show to you how the illegal occupation of the right-of-way at pipeline kilometer 28 was ended. The illegal blockade of the pipeline construction led by Professor Sulak Sivaraksa at pipeline kilometer 28. The picture is showing Professor Sulak and his followers in their camp. They delayed our pipeline works and jeopardized the entire project completion, and this was not acceptable for Thailand at all. The Thai authorities tolerated those illegal protesters for quite a while, but it came the day when enough was enough. Here is the story how the protest was finally cleared. On 5 March 1998, PTT called me in our Kanchanaburi office and instructed me to get our construction equipment ready for the next morning at 6 a.m. They advised me that I should inform only people about this instruction who had to know it. Accordingly, I informed only our Section 2 pipeline superintendent Heinz Orth and my deputy Dr. Pongsak. On the next day on 6 March 1998, we, Dr. Pongsak and myself, met Heinz Orth at pipeline kilometer 28. I ordered Heinz Orth to start our construction equipment and move forward to pipeline kilometer 27. All of our equipment was started at around 6.15 in the morning and moved forward to the area occupied by the protesters. But the engine and driving noises caused by our heavy construction equipment, we had woken up the protesters and they started to run out of their camp towards our construction equipment. When they reached our equipment, they blocked it by sitting down in front of our large Cat D9 dozer and our excavators. Our Dr. Pongsak spoke to the protesters and requested them to move out of our way, but they ignored his request and smiled at him in an unfriendly way. Someone put out his tongue forward to us to tell us fuck off. But for sure we did not fuck off. We had to build a pipeline here. Those people tried to provoke us and were only waiting for the occasion that we would make something wrong like to use force with our construction equipment to push them away. We did not. Between the Thai people there were two or three foreigners sitting and standing in front of our construction equipment. I was only thinking what in the hell are you doing here in the middle of the deep jungle in Thailand. Some of the Thai protesters held pictures from His Majesty the King and the Queen of Thailand in their hands. Then I looked to the surrounding area and I saw Professor Sulak jumping out of a small water source in the jungle where he took his morning bath like in a very pleasant camping adventure. It looked like he was quite enjoying his stay in the jungle together with the young people that participated in the protest. All the activities that we have done during the clearing action were filmed by a television station. Those protesters laid down a picture of His Majesty the King and Queen behind our dozer, just waiting for us to drive over the picture, which of course we had not done. Just a dirty action of those good protesters. The media at this time was 100% behind this group. Subsequently, Professor Sulak hurried up and walked fast to our Cat D9 dozer and joined the group of protesters who were blocking our construction machines already. There were around 60 protesters. All our equipment was stopped. As a surprise for all of us the governor of Kanchanaburi, including some other officials and a police force arrived. The police force was wearing their normal gear, some of them had a policeman's truncheon in their hands. Dr. Ponsak and I went to the to the governor of Kanchanaburi and reported that our work was blocked and could not continue with our activities until the protesters were gone. The authorities told us to make a breakout with our excavators while the protesters were still blocking our Cat D9 dozer. I followed the government order to break out with two of our excavators. It was done by us and everybody was suddenly running behind us including the authorities. The protesters could not follow us so fast and were quite confused. At this time, it was already 9 o'clock in the morning, the air became hot and sticky some people started to sweat. Maybe they were afraid of what was coming. One should remember that it was Thailand that decided to have the pipeline built here in this forest area and after all the hearings of pro and contra, the final decision was made to go ahead. Finally, the governor of the Kanchanaburi province personally instructed about 20 police officers to remove the illegal protesters from the right-of-way where they had stopped us for months. Subsequently, the government officials and the police came into big action. They asked the protesters to free the right-of-way, but the protesters refused to do so, and the situation became hot. The police started to carry some of the protesters away. Other protesters followed the police instruction and moved out towards the police cars and our crew buses that we had made available to the police upon their request. One of the foreign protesters who did not follow the instruction of the police to move out got hit by a truncheon. 
after this city started to move fast. The Professor Sulak was surrounded by the police and taken away. There was no chance anymore for the protesters to resist. At this time the entire situation was extremely tense. Only good that nobody of the protesters had a pistol. Another group of the protesters were running away into the jungle and I do not know what happened to them. For sir you have to walk for a while to get out of this jungle. The best way was along our service road to go to road 3272. Those illegal protesters have caused a lot of problems. Government officials with the police and our help removed the entire protesters camp and finally the way was free for our construction work. It was for sure not a nice day for all of us. The situation was very tense, but it had to be done by the Thai government in this way on the 6th of March 1998. We were very careful by moving our heavy construction equipment with all those careless protesters around us. Fortunately, nobody as far as I know was severely injured during this clearing action. But with this morning action my day was not over yet. In the afternoon I had to go to pipeline kilometer 152 and help by coordinating our construction equipment the Thai authorities and the police to clear that area which was illegal occupied for eight months by some protesters already. But this is another story and maybe in order that not all will be forgotten, I should make a video about this. Now I will tell you how the pipeline work was conducted after the right of way at pipeline kilometer 28 was cleared from the blockade. So, I begin to inform you with the area of pipeline kilometer 28 to 27.5 in which there was no restricted right of way and we commenced quickly with our earthwork after Professor Sulak and his followers were kicked out. In this area our pipeline spread limited right of way, performed the work starting a KP28 and worked towards KP27.5. Those crews moved very fast forward because we were in a race against the upcoming rainy season and we should remember when working on a mountainside, everything you do is hard. Everything takes twice as long as on a normal project in a flat area. We needed to do the following activities pipeline activities kilometer 28 to 27.5. Work step number one, surveying and marking, clearing, grubbing and grading right of way. Work step number two, trench ditching with some blasting in rock areas. Work step number three, sand bedding of the trench bottom. Work step number four, hauling and stringing of the line pipes. Work step number five, bending of the line pipes. Work step number six, line up and welding. Work step number 7, radiographic testing of the welds. Work step number 8, field joint coating of the welds and line pipe coating repairs. Work step number 9, lowering in which included in one area the placement of some concrete riders. Work step number 10, tie-in work of the pipeline. Work step number 11, backfilling of the pipeline that included sand padding, conduit and warning tape laying. It is time now that I will tell you about the area restricted right of way. Our entire logistics had to be mobilized to this area. We had to use this area to stockpile pipes and to store fuel tanks, sandbags, materials, stakes, and equipment parts for maintenance. In addition, we needed space for parking of our construction equipment, workers' trucks. As a kind of office in the area of pipeline kilometer 27.5, we used first our cars and transport buses, later we installed some containers. We needed to install fuel tanks on chain tracked vehicles. For the limited right of way, we modified some containers to be used as offices and where our people would have shelter for catering and bad weather. The work crews needed to be organized and equipped. Modifications on pipe transporters for personnel transportation needed to be done. Every aspect of the project was impacted and driven by the unique mountain working conditions. From getting our workers, equipment and pipe into the limited right of way worksite, to staging everything on the side of a mountain that still needed to be cleared of dense forestry. This area of the deep jungle was completely isolated. We had only limited radio communication that was working. The steep hill at pipeline kilometer 27.5 was very important since it was the only access and the entrance door to the restricted right of way. It is vital to know that only construction equipment on chains was able to climb up this hill. We started to build the right of way on this hill on 6th of March 1998, immediately after it was free of the illegal occupants. On this hill slope we had heavy cat dozers and excavators working there. To give you the right picture on the foot of this hill pass was the creek Pracham Mai. This creek was later diverted by us through a 42-inch pipe. Prior to the start of construction by us on the restricted the right-of-way it had to be free of marketable trees, which should be logged and removed by the Thai Forestry Department. This work had to be completed for the whole of the restricted area before our work could be started. The presence of our construction equipment on the right-of-way would have prevented the hauling of trees out of this area. Due to the tremendous time pressure including the dry season weather window I decided to follow somehow unwillingly PTT's request to assist the Thai Forestry Department with our construction equipment to transport the timber out of the right-of-way area. There was no other way for us than to assist, otherwise the clearance would have taken three months by itself. 
after the right of way at the hill of pipeline kilometer 27.5 was prepared our equipment went ahead and removed the log trees and I can tell you we were fast. Given the restricted width of the right of way, there was no space available for the separate storage of topsoil. We preserved as much topsoil as was practicable. However, it was unavoidable that that some topsoil became mixed with other excavated material. Some of the special work planning to overcome the right of way space restriction was noy so easy. I was thinking day and night on the pipe welding and the two subsequent activities namely X-ray testing and joint coating. In my mind I had double joints in order to minimize those activities in the restricted right of way. Such a double joint has a weight of around 12 tons. I decided to do a test. On 8 of March 1998 after we successfully conducted a double joint transport test at the steep hill on pipeline kilometer 27.5 and I instructed our staff to use double joints as much as possible. Some people like our idiot of construction manager and our equipment manager were not in favor of it. But Heinz Orth our spread boss was and he liked the double joints a lot. But those double joints the number of bell holes to be excavated went drastically down as well. In total we made 132 manual metal arc welded double joints in a temporary double joint yard open by us close to block valve station 3. In spite of the incredibly steep terrain of the pipeline route, it worked out very well and resulted in a total length of approximately 3.3 kilometers. Single pipe joints were transported from PTT's Ratchaburi pipe yard to our double joint yard to be welded, tested and joint coated. Our double joint yard was quite busy and trucks were queuing up and waited to be unloaded. With the pipe double joints, we now had a spare cable crane because the double joints were too heavy for this crane and could not be used. We decided to install this cable crane at pipeline kilometer 27.5 to lift up equipment and material on this hill. For pipe laying it was not used. On this occasion I have to tell a story about our equipment manager Alman, rest in peace. This guy was telling me that I could not use the cable crane to transport our staff. I replied and asked him did you lose your mind? When we can transport a 6-ton pipe with this cable crane for sure we can transport people having a weight less than 100 kg. After he heard my reply, he was stuttering, then we had to use a cage for the transport. I answered, then hurry up and built one. Some of our people were sometimes quite strange. Maybe too much sunshine on their heads in Thailand. The way to the Jadana pipeline kilometer 27.5 from block valve 3 via road 3272 was around 24 km long. The direct pipeline right of way was not usable for trucks. We had built a temporary service road connecting the road 3272 with pipeline kilometer 27.5. From road 3272 we had to turn left on the way to the so-called jungle garden. Our security people had installed road signs to find the way. Of course, in 1998 we did not have Google Maps as well. We used paper maps. Daily maintenance work was carried out on the service road. There was permanently a greater working. This service road included the crossing of the small river Pracham Mai, on which we had constructed a fort for passing our vehicles. It must be said that PTT's unfriendly construction decision to restrict the right of way from 20 to 12 meters resulted in fewer trees being cut than it was originally planned. But this was a logical consequence of the restricted right of way, having a total length of 6 kilometers from pipeline kilometer 26.8 to pipeline kilometer 20.8. Of course, in some small areas it was unavoidable for us that the right-of-way was a wider than 12 meters. DTT's engineering and inspection consultant Nova Gas used this matter as a reason for trying not to compensate us for the restricted right-of-way. Such an approach was totally ridiculous. This engineering consultant was a Canadian-based company, and one would assume that they would know that working in the mountains is very difficult and that we could not control the rain and gravity on the right-of-way. Just some guys from Nova Gas just wanted to hurt us. They should have concentrated much more on their own design work that had many mistakes and errors. I worked in my career with some pipeline engineering companies, but such an outfit as Nova Gas I never had experienced. You have to look only to my River Kwai video, then you will know what crap we were dealing with. Anyhow, the Nova Gas project manager Gallagher told me once that Dr. Pitty, the president of the PTT Gas Division, instructed Nova Gas to hurt us wherever possible. I would say that they could have decided by themselves in which way and how they would deal with us. They decided to do it in a dirty way to hurt us, and they enjoyed it. In respect to Dr. Pity, I have to say that this man did not like the Tasco Mansman joint venture because we took the Jandana pipeline job away from his favorite Bechtel company. Dr. Pity was a big friend of Bechtel. The restricted right of way was simply a one way dead end street for pipeline construction. Changes in traffic directions were almost impossible. Our safety personnel controlled the right of way traffic. After we had cleared the area up to the end by our heavy Cat D9 dozers, our construction work started at KP 20.8 and moved in the direction to KP 26.8. 
our starting point was also close to the steep hill around KP20.5. At the steep hill KP20.5 was a cable crane installed. This cable crane was used for the pipe erection. From this steep hill with up to 73% steepness, there was no access to the restricted right-of-way. As said before, the only possible access for us was from KP27.5. The trench excavation work for the pipeline was carried out by us before any pipes were strung. We used backhoes to excavate the trench that was approximately 2.5 meter deep. To the extent practicable, we tried to keep the trench walls vertical to avoid too much excavated earth on the right-of-way. Due to the mountain topography the trench was in some areas up to 3.5 meter deep. As it can be seen on the pictures included in this video, the excavated material had to be graded onto the right the right-of-way. In some few occasions we stored the earth material adjacent to the right-of-way. We had to use rock blasting as well in areas with hard rock. The rock blasting procedure as used by us was drilling holes into a rock mass to a certain depth, with some spacing that allowed the explosion to fracture the rock. In this process, the rock was fractured enough to be broken down to the sizes removable by our excavators. This was a controlled blasting technique that we used in order to reduce the amount of overbreak, flying rock, and to control some of the ground vibrations. All the pipe field bending was done outside the right-of-way in the area of pipeline kilometer 27.5, close to the temporary excess road. I have to say that the utilization of double joints had another advantage in respect to the bending steps that could be applied. It is simple because a longer double-jointed pipe can obtain more bending steps in comparison to a single pipe, and the bend becomes larger. With this fact some of the hot bends were not needed. This effect led to the cancellation of a Russian Antonov transport airplane that was supposed to fly about 20 hot bends from Dusseldorf in Germany to Bangkok in Thailand. The double joint speeded up our construction progress, and it turned out that it was the absolute right decision to use those. The pipes including pipe bends were transported to the area where the trench was opened and subsequently directly lowered into the trench. Bell holes for the welding applications were prepared before. Manual pipe welding was performed inside the trench. Again, more than 50% of our pipes were double joints. We used our sight booms to lower the pipe into the trench. In respect to side booms, I have to say that we had a sufficient quantity to do or work from light to heavy booms. We had to carry out field welding of around 320 pipe joints, including X-ray tests and fusion bonded epoxy joint coating, in the restricted right-of-way. Every weld was examined by X-ray testing and certified by all parties. Fusion bonded epoxy joint coating on the outside of the pipeline joints was performed in the bell hole as well. A high voltage tool checked the integrity of the coating. Such a tool even detects the smallest defect. This test was conducted by us on each welded joint and over the entire pipe length. For the cathodic protection connections CAD welds were made and epoxy coated as well. Factory hot bends for the restricted right of way, KP26.8 to KP20.8. Due to the nature of the topography with a restricted 12 meter right of wear required sometimes hot bends since field bends could not facilitate the required bending radius that we needed. For this reason, we ordered, after we had received change order number 22 on 3rd of October 1997, a total number of 30 hot bends, out of which were 25 pieces, with a 5D radius, and 5 pieces a 10D radius. The higher bending degree the hot bends reduced some amount of excavation work and subsequently backfill work. For bedding of the trench bottom, we used the screening plant Dynapid K46 where it was possible. In areas where this was not possible, we used sand backs and rock shields to protect the pipe fusion bonded epoxy coating. When you consider the distance from pipeline kilometer 27.5 to pipeline kilometer 20, you have a length of 7.5 kilometer. In this pipeline stretch were installed around 600 sack barriers. For this we needed around 120,000 sand backs. For padding we used the screening plant Dynapid K46 as well. As stated before, in some areas we protect the pipe by wrapping rock shield to it. We had two Dynapid K46 screening plants. The other work we have to talk about was backfilling, because due to the restricted access, sand could not be transported over the right-of-way and hence could not be used for padding. As I said before for the protection for the pipes in this area, we used rock shield, with backfill comprising material obtained from the excavation, without any larger stone inclusions. We used here the screening plant the Dynapid K46 as well, that produced the optimum graded filling material from the excavated material. This machine was attached to CAT Sideboom 583 that held the plant over the trench. Following this, subsoil and topsoil if it was available were replaced in the sequence in which they were removed. Before the last layer of earth backfill was done the high-density polyethylene twin conduit for the fiber optic cable and the warning tape was laid down, and subsequently the trench was backfilled with a berm on top as it can be seen in this video. 
In June of 1997 somebody wrote a newspaper article titled Pipe Dreams with a Questionnaire and criticized PTT including the Thai government heavily for using the forest route for the pipeline. On 2 April 1998, I arranged a visit with PTT's top management to travel along the pipeline route between pipeline kilometer 27 and pipeline kilometer 20. I told Dr. Pity that now your pipe dreams are getting reality. He smiled happily like a young boy. We used a modified chain track pipe loader and the entire PPT team including Dr. Pity climbed on and we went down the entire way of the restricted right of way. The whole PTT team was impressed by what they saw and enjoyed this trip. In spite of all the nice miles that Dr. Pity had, the single biggest impact for our work in the mountain area was the rain. Precipitation that would be shrugged off on a normal worksite became cause for alarm. Everybody from us was always watching the sky. But watching the sky did not help a lot. On the 8th of May 1998 the rainy season started and this was a significant delay impact and caused an extraordinarily safety hazard to our pipeline workers and equipment. Heinz Orth, a very experienced pipeliner told me I never saw the weather impact on a project like this one. A half inch of rain would make the ground so slick, you could not climb to the worksite using your hands and feet. And if you did, you could slide all the way to the bottom. Of course, we as pipeliners knew that rain has a significant impact when it comes to our pipeline construction and causes for sure delays. Our pipeline construction work relied heavily on good weather conditions in order to carry out work tasks effectively and this especially in an area with steep slopes and a narrow right of way. Our original pipeline construction schedule was planned in such a way that in the mountain section, we would work not in the rainy season. Due to the facts stated in this video before this was not possible anymore. Our construction work now conducted in the rainy season caused significant delays that led to increased costs, and our entire work became more dangerous by a very slippery right-of-way and trench collapses. Over and beyond the rain flushed away sandbags located at the trench bottom used for bedding, and many other safety hazards occurred to workers and equipment, such as stormwater runoffs and even landslides. It stopped all our driving with pickups, trucks and even construction equipment driven by steel chains. We installed snow chains on our pickups, but this could also not help a lot. Our cars and equipment repairs increased dramatically. All of this caused significantly slower progress of our work. Let me just summarize once more our work activities in short. After the completion of the right-of-way the trench was excavated. Most of the excavated material was graded onto the right-of-way in order to keep it free for equipment, material and personnel movements. The pipe length started from KP 20.800 onwards and went into the direction of KP 26.800. Due to the method of laying of pipes in the trench, there was also additional effort for the preparation of bell holes required at each of the field joints, which involved additional excavation and backfill work, as well as the storage of the excavated material. Here helped the usage of double joints and minimized the excavation of bell holes. It became also required to have hard ditch plugs installed in the trench in areas with slopes. The backfill and reinstatement operation of the pipeline trench and right-of-way was carried out as follows. 1. Rock shield was placed, geotextile, at rocky areas of the pipeline to protect the FBE coating. 2. Sack barriers were placed into the trench. 3. First layer of backfill with excavated material was placed into the trench. 4. Fiber optic cable twin duct was installed on top of the pipeline. 5. Pipeline warning tape was installed. 6. Final backfill was placed into the trench with the excavated material. 7. Cleanup and restoration including pipeline markers, aerial signs, pipeline erosion control, including installed diversion berms, slope stabilization and revegetation. From pipeline kilometer 26.8, we approached a hill located at pipeline kilometer 27.5. At this hill the entire right-of-way work with a width of 20 meters was already completed. With this the pipeline work became easier again because the right-of-way was wider. Our pipe work was done from the top to the bottom because we used the pipeline that was already in place on the restricted right-of-way as an anchor for the pipes to be installed. Here we excavated the trench first as well and laid down our pipe subsequently. Down at the bottom of the trench was the creek Prachamai that we had diverted as I told you before. In the area we experienced some rock. This rock was removed by excavators including some rock hammers. Of course, in this area we had radio communication. Our fuel tanks to fill up our equipment and everything else were close by at the bottom of the slope, and let me say the pipeline or life was improved, especially when it rained because we were just nearer to our own infrastructure that we had built up by ourselves there. It was just safer there to work. On the 22nd of June 1998, the first part of the required hydro test of a small section from pipeline kilometer 27 plus 140 to 26 plus 810, over which is a distance of 830 meter was successfully performed. 
On 26 June 1998, the work at the area of the restricted right-of-way between KP26.8 to KP20.8 was substantially completed. Now before I come to the steep mountain slope, I have to tell you another short story that is in my other video that I have published on YouTube. Jadana, my project experience and length explained, and I will keep it very short here. On Saturday, 4 April 1998, a fatal side boom accident at pipeline kilometer 27 happened at 4.30 in the afternoon. I was sitting in my office in Kanchanaburi and listening to the TMJV radio when I heard this horrible accident story. I believe when I saw the entire area and situation at pipeline kilometer 27 on Sunday morning on 5 April 1998 that the operator of the side boom was drunk and was speeding with our side boom like a racing driver. A normal driver with a clear mind would never have turned over this equipment. The operator disappeared after the accident and returned some days later to us at the Sayak camp. Of course, at his time he was clear already. His colleague when he did run away was dead laying underneath the 18-ton machine. This poor man was hardly recognizable anymore as Heinz Orth told me because he saw the dead body in the hospital of Tong Papum for identification. Coming back to Sunday the 5th of April 1998. During our salvage some of our people passed by and told us that a young elephant around pipeline kilometer 23 on the restricted right of way went into the pipeline trench and was unable to get out. It was around 10.30 in the morning. After the salvage action was done by us, we all climbed on a side boom and drove to pipeline kilometer 23. There we saw the young elephant in the trench. First of all, I got furious with our staff and asked why no passages for wildlife were made in the trench. Such passages are a common pipeline practice in areas with wildlife, and all the people present should have known this. It is very easy to do it as well. As number one here to mention that it was another failure of our idiot construction manager Worler. But Heinz Orth was not clean here as well. I received only senseless answers from our staff. My instruction was given to fill up a part of the trench so that the animal could walk out. As soon as the passage was finished by using an excavator filling up a part of the trench with earth the animal walked unharmed out. From this entire action pictures were made as well. What a very bad weekend it was the 4th and 5th of April 1998. The next morning PTT's project director Sampong called me and seemed to be quite nervous. He stated to me that there was a picture in a Bangkok newspaper showing the elephant in the pipeline trench. Furthermore, he stated that the NGO obtained those pictures illegally from Photoshop in Kanchanaburi, to which we gave our film for development. He said that PTT's governor Paula Sukosh was very upset with the situation and it would have consequences. My reply was why. When PTT roots a 42-inch pipeline through the middle of a deep virgin forest, it should not be a surprise for anyone that there are wild animals and that something could happen to the wildlife. And why did your engineering consultant Nova Gas did not specify and request animal passages on our pipeline trench? There was no reply from PTT's project director Sampong. When I conclude on this incident, I have to say that each party involved overlooked the fact that some earth passages were not built to allow wild animals to pass the pipeline trench easily. It was a mistake by us as well, because some earth passages would have been filled quickly into the trench without any problems, and it would have cost a little bit of our time only. Of course, following this incident passages were built. Please allow me to say that nowadays it would not have happened that our pictures were stolen from Photoshop, because with all our smartphones, we do not need such a shop anymore. Now I will talk about the steep mountain at pipeline kilometer 20.5. The rugged mountain at pipeline kilometer 20.5 was an inaccessible steep terrain as you can see on the pictures included here. Working on such a steep 35 plus degree slope required experienced hill crews working in the mountains. Not all pipeliners can work in such an environment. We use special construction techniques to overcome this challenge. Building this part of the Jadana pipeline on the steep incline was very slow and dangerous. There was always the danger of rocks, debris or equipment falling down the hill, risking those below. It was difficult to stand on this steep incline and of course one could hardly walk. The whole massive of around 6 tons pipe joints in such an inclined position and weld those together is quite problematic. Therefore, we installed later a cable crane in order to make our work somewhat easier. Of course, the right-of-way and trench work were our first two activities to be done. For this we started by surveying and marking. Afterwards the clearing, grubbing and grading followed to make the right-of-way. For this work we used two Cat D9 dozers. One dozer was tethered via winch line to another dozer at the top of the slope to ensure the safety of the construction personnel and equipment. The dozer on the slope worked its way down to the bottom over a distance of around 300 meters. We removed all tree stumps and other organic material on the slope, including rock that the Cat D9 dozer was able to push out. At this moment we could see the slope very clear, and it looked already more accessible for the performance of our next work action. 
It was time now for our drilling equipment to go into action for the preparation of the holes for blasting. Then the blasting was done. After the blasting our excavators in different sizes came into action and cleared out the blasted rock and other earth materials until the trench was finished, including the bell holes for welding. As I said before to help us on this rugged terrain, we installed a cable crane. We decided to install the pipes from the top to the bottom because at this point, we could connect the first pipe to an already existing pipe string. But this connection we had an anchor to hold those pipes to be installed. So, our work was conducted from pipeline kilometer 20.8 down to pipeline kilometer 20.5. The line pipes, each around 12.5 meters long were transported via Bani Tong and were stockpiled at the bottom of the mountain, adjacent to the winch of the cable crane. The cable crane track rope with its socket was attached to anchors on both ends, and the cable crane system was aligned along the center line of the pipeline, the operating length was around 400 meters. Its lifting capacity was approximately 10 tons, which was sufficient for a single pipe installation. We had a total number of 24 pipes to be lifted. The pipes were attached to the slings and lifted with the crane unit from the bottom to the top. Once the pipe arrived at the designated lowering end point, it was positioned accurately by the rigger in communication with the winch operator, adjusting the horizontal and vertical alignment. Subsequently, the pipe was lowered to the final position by operating the two lifting units of the crane unit independently. When the pipe was in its final location down at the trench bottom laying on sandbags, it was aligned by our pipifitters using an external pipe clamp and fitted to that pipe which was already in place. Afterwards the welding was done by our qualified welders, followed by a visual inspection. Later on, from a platform above the weld, the X-ray testing, sandblasting and coating works were carried out. In this way the mechanical assembling of the pipe string on the slope was done by us. Other materials such as sandbags, rock shields, earth and small equipment including personal, were lifted as well. Those things let me say flew up a steep mountain with a speed of around 1.5 meter per second. This cable crane transportation technology from LCS cable cranes was effective and it was used by us successfully. Within the trench, sand-filled sacks were stacked across the width of the trench. This permitted the water to slowly filter through without carrying large amounts of soil with it. Ditch trench breakers were installed in the trench along the pipeline slope to slow the movement of water along the trench. In the upper part of the ditch breaker was a 4-inch PVC pipe placed in order to allow some slow drainage of any water. The pipeline was padded and the trench backfilled by equipment tethered to the winch tractors. We used the cable crane as well to lift up earth material in a shut. Upon arrival to its location the shut was emptied and the action was repeated. Excavators did the required backfill activities to fill up the trench. A layer of rock pieces and riprap was installed as well, and after this vetiver grass was planted. On 7 July 1998 our pipeline hydro test was successfully performed from pipeline kilometer 26 plus 810 to 17 plus 892 over a distance of 8.418 meter. On 31 July 1998 our entire work was completed on the steep slope of pipeline kilometer 20.5. On 21 August 1998 mechanical completion was achieved instead of 15 June 1998, a delay of 67 days that proved that our acceleration work was successfully executed. Here one can only say congratulations to the Taskam Ansman joint venture for the good work performed. On 21 September 1998 was the start of the pipeline system operation. It was changed by PTT from the original date of 15 August 1998. On 26 September 1998, PTT agreed to our time extension request and gave us an additional 101 days. With this agreement to extend the contract time, PTT acknowledged that the delay which occurred on the project was completely out of our control. To give you an idea where this pipeline location of this steep slope is, you would have to go to Bani Tong then Somsak Mining, subsequent to Block Valve 2, and pass it for 2 kilometers, and you arrive at the slope. But this is for people only that are looking for an adventure. In the 25 years after the Jadana project was finished I visited many pipeline points, but I never went back to this slope. Goodbye and thank you for watching.